can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Uh, some founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. You should check out past interviews. Um, Mobileye, if you haven't heard of Mobileye, they ended up being acquired by Intel for $13.2 billion. And, and you'll see what I love about the stories, they talk about the journey, and the journey is up, but it's also down. And so, uh, Moise talked about how he had to go back to his family his wife and kids and basically tell him we're pulling you out of all extracurricular activities because the, the pay was cut uh, after a period of time. And the founder of, check out the founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, who is Steve Jobs' mentor, and he talks about how he turned down, um, and Yossi, you can relate to this, he turned down, uh, Steve Jobs offered him $50,000 for 33% of Apple and why he turned it down at the time. Okay. Um, that and many more, check out inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients, and we help you run your podcast. And for me, Yossi, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I always look at how can I give to my best relationships. And a podcast is a platform I can use to get other people's thought leadership out there to the world. So if you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. And it was actually inspired by my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor. And um, there is an interview that lives on inspiredinsider.com about page about his, he was interviewed by the Holocaust Foundation. And so it's not just business, but I feel like it's leaving a legacy for people beyond um, you know, beyond their years. So check out rise25.com. And I'm going to introduce you to today's guest and a big thank you to Yuri uh, Adoni, the author of The Unstoppable Startup, Mastering Israel's Secret Rules of Chutzpah for telling me, you know, Yossi is a must person. Out of everyone in the, Isra you know, Israel or business world in general, not just Israel, is a must. And if you don't know, Yossi Vardi is an Israeli entrepreneur and investor. He's one of Israel's first high-tech entrepreneurs. And for over 50 years, he's founded and helped to build over 100 high-tech companies in a variety of fields. In 1996, he became the founding investor of Mirabilis, uh, Mirabilis, the creator of ICQ, which was the first instant messaging application that was released to the web that AOL eventually bought for, I believe, a presumed $400 million. Among the companies he's invested in or helped are Answers.com that went public, Airlink, which sold to Sierra Wireless, Tavella sold to Cisco, Scopus, which went public, Foxy Tunes sold to Yahoo, Two Cows went public, and many more. And but really, you'll see the only reason I had you on is because you tell good, Jew, great Jewish jokes. So thanks for joining me. Nice to be here. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about. There's so much to talk about, but I figured a big influence for you was your parents and your mom. And the talk about the business they were in and what you learned from them. Yeah. Okay. That's a that's a good question. Uh, my, as you may know, 1948 we had the independence war. My father went to the war like many people at his age. I think at that time he was 38 and practically disappeared for a period from our life and my mother had to provide for me and my brother so she opened a small restaurant with only six table and this was kind of a neighborhood restaurant which served what she knew very well to cook and this is a uh, jewish uh, east european food now if you are not familiar with the Jewish cuisine, is because actually there is no such a thing like a Jewish cuisine. Jewish cuisine is uh, you, you take what, what remains, you know, and, and, and you cook it. And I learned many of, uh, of the business principles at a restaurant where I spent uh, when I spent time, first of all, she used to have a recursive cooking. What is recursive cooking? <coughs> I'm sorry. 
she used today the remaining of yesterday. And the remaining of and yesterday, she cooked the remaining from the, way, the day before yesterday. And so on and so on and so on. And my brother and me still are pondering when did she bought the original product. <laughs> right. Because she always used the remaining, you know. So this was uh, one lesson. Also, she was one, or this is not known, one of the founders of biotechnology in Israel, in spite of the fact that she finished maybe eight years of study before she came to Israel, uh, she, she dealt with biotechnology in the way that she was able, because it, it was the, the early days of the country and there was no product, it was an austerity time. She knew how to turn every organic substance into chopped liver, whether it was feathers or paper, etc., or she used to convert it to to chopped liver. And I learned uh, some very important uh, things from her. Maybe last example, uh, when I met with my bankers, I always used to pinch them. Pinch. This is you call pinch. What do you call this movement? Poke. Oak. Oak. Poke. Yeah. Poke. Poke. I used to poke them on the on the cheek and they always resented it and they asked me why you do it and I told them I learned it from my mother because when she went to the market to buy fish she always poked the fish to see if it's fresh you know if it will come back <laughs> it's fresh if it stayed depressed then she know the fish stinks and I need to know the situations of my bankers etc 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 maybe Maybe the last thing that I, I will mention, you say that the parents have a strong influence on their siblings, and it's definitely the case in Israel. You know, I'm being asked time and again why we have this phenomena of startups, you know, that every kid in Israel wants to create a startup. And this is definitely because of the Jewish mother. Every kid in Israel has a Jewish mother, and she drives him crazy, you know, from the age of six. She tells him, after all what we have done for you, is it too much to ask you to bring home one Nobel Prize? You know, one Nobel Prize. And, uh, and we leave home at, uh, at the, first of December, the first of September, when we are six years old, go to the school, and we know that we go to fight our way for this one, uh, one uh, Nobel Prize. And, uh, and the, maybe another thing I will mention that the Jewish mother know her way how to push her son towards this goal. She used, she manipulated him with, uh, with a combination of uh, guilt feeling, feelings and and panic, she always told me why all my sisters and brothers, not me, her sisters and brothers, have sons and, who are geniuses, and she's the only one to have an idiot as a son. And uh, she explained to me that they are smart and I'm an idiot because they are not contaminated with the genes of my father. So this gives you kind of the background in a nutshell from where I, from where I came. And unfortunately, yes. you know, my sons, the pressure she put on me, I put on my sons because I'm their Jewish mother, because to be Jewish mother is not a matter <coughs> of gender and it's not a matter of ethnicity. It's a state of mind. It's some kind of... Uh, of brain disorder, you know, brain disorder, and it's not a matter of uh, of gender or eth uh, ethnicity. So I'm the Jewish mother of my kids. You'll see Jewish guilt is strong. Yeah, Jewish guilt is very strong. You know the story about the, the mother who bought her son uh, two, two ties, one... Uh, one blue and one red, and he come on Saturday to please her with the red one. She looked at him and she said to him, ah, you don't like the blue one. So next Saturday he's come with the blue one. She looked at him and she said, ah, you don't like the red one. 
So next Saturday he came with the blue one and on the top of it the red one. And he stand at the door and look at his mother. And she doesn't know what to say for five seconds. And then she tell me, I told you your wife will drive you crazy. <laughs> uh, you know, um, you'll see your first startup in 1969, right? What, what did you, what were you doing before the start, the first startup? Or what did you think you were going to be doing? I knew what I'm going to, to do since, yeah, since, since maybe sixth grade. I knew that I'm going to be an engineer and I knew that it, I will deal with electronics because I was obsessed. I was what is called today, it's like a badge of honor. You know, when I was a kid, it was kind of a psychological disaster syndrome. I was a nerd, which means I couldn't care less about football or girls. When all my friends chased girls, I chased vacuum tubes, and I thought to myself, what bunch of idiots, you know, why they're interested in girls. Vacuum tubes are much more uh, interesting. And I used to read uh, three books every day, and I used to disassemble any <laughs> anything which I saw. Sometimes it creates some really unpleasant uh, situation when I left all kinds of objects at the home of my friends in a, in a bag after I, I was, I was very good at disassembling. It's pity that I was not as good as in reassembling it. Um, your first startup, was that the one you started with $5,000? My first, excuse me just a minute. Uh, and I, it's not that I put $5,000, this was a lot of money. We were six people that each one put $800. And we created a software company, which was the number, the fifth software company in Israel. It was 1969. We were sure that we missed the boat, we missed the train, and it's too late, and the market is being taken by the by the five, uh, by the four earlier one, but uh, luckily we were able to make it and in few years it became the biggest software house in Israel. Don't be too impressed because it took us to get to 300 people to become the biggest software house in Israel. So what was from that, um, what, did you, what did it do? What did it do at the time? I had very very smart two childhood friends that learned with me in the high school. They were geniuses in programming. And we decided that we are going to do a real-time software. This, this word is not known anymore because everything now is real-time. Yeah. But real-time software at that time was software that was able to collect data from all kinds of sensors and in real time process them and give results either in automation or in defense systems or in industrial systems that the processing had to be very fast so in order to respond to real time world which today is elementary but at that time when you used to run the software in batches you used to have a deck of cards, every line of code was equal to a, a card and you used to go with a shoebox full of cards, deposit it in, in some IBM service center and went 24 hours and wait 24 hours until you got the result. It's, it's amazing to think of what the landscape was in 1969 as far as computers then and now what would a computer, what, would, what were you using and what did it cost at the time? It cost millions, but it had, uh, I remember at, at the Technion, the computer, Technion, as you may know, is the highest uh, higher education technological school in Israel. The computer had 16K 
memory, 16K. Mm. Not meg, not jig, K. And, uh, and there was one in, in Tel Aviv University with 32K. So to do my master degree, I got some time I could use on that machine. It was really very, very rudimentary. And, uh, and part of the programming was how to compress everything to this very little tiny memory. I think the uh, a one, a one, uh, one uh, smartphone today has more computing power <laughs> than the whole accumulated computing power in the world at that time. Yeah. But these were different times. It's amazing. Yeah. Something that costs millions of dollars now it costs like $150 right now, today. Yeah, um, somebody, <laughs> somebody made the calculation that if this kind of scaling would happen in the car industry, a car would cost $2. And we'll go in a speed of 75,000 miles per hour, something like this. And yet we take it for, for granted, you know, we even yeah. don't think about it anymore, totally. about this, this wonder. What were some of the, Yossi, what were some of the lessons you learned then? How did you get customers? Like now, you know, people can go online. They can advertise online. They, you know, there's, so, there's a multitude of ways to get customers. What were some of the lessons you learned at that time for getting traction? Yeah, first of all, I would like to, to start what the lesson, not about customer, but the general lesson. The general lesson that I learned from these early years, you know, both my childhood and my adolescence and the, and the first years I was doing things, that probably the one bless that a young person can get is to have a very high level of curiosity. Hmm. I think curiosity is the biggest gift you can, you can get. It's really, if you are a curious person, you're never going to be bored. And also it will lead you to all kinds of doors and avenues and pathways that you, you really don't know. And uh, staying, being curious, staying curious, I think, I think it's, a, it's a blessing. You know, I cannot, I cannot see until today a book without opening it, you know, and beginning to, to try to, to, to understand what is the story and what it talks about, etc., etc. Regarding marketing, luckily, because of the talent of my friends, we didn't have problems of marketing, you know, they, uh, the customer came to us because we really possessed uh, something, I don't want to say unique, but something which was needed at that, at that uh, time. And uh, f in general, I can tell you that uh, my, my biggest success in, in the business or in the high tech, which was my, my investment in uh, ICQ, which I have done for no fault of mine. You know, I really didn't understand what I'm doing. Nevertheless, when we sold the company, we became overnight a bunch of geniuses and uh, thin <laughs> and blue eyes and blonde and tall and whatever, whatever you want. But ICQ, the product was distributed virally, much like the pandemic. We didn't have to invest any effort. We just were sitting like this, watching the numbers with, uh, how George Bush called it, shock and O, with O, not with shock, with O. And, uh, and we didn't do any, any marketing offering, you know, we didn't spend a penny in the marketing, the, the market just loved it. So I don't think I'm a marketing maven, you know, marketing for me is always associated with very high cost, mm -hmm. which you remember what uh, Mr. Goldwyn said about marketing. 
He said it more about advertising. He said, I know that I'm throwing to the garbage half of the money. The problem, I don't know which half I'm throwing. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, I've heard that. So I, I, love, I love products which distribute themselves by, because of the user experience. And therefore, mm. in all my work, and especially in the, in the internet space, my focus and my emphasis was always to create a wonderful experience and this will do the sales on its own. One example, you look, you look at the growth of the explosion of Zoom, which is a platform with unbelievable user experience. They went from 10 million people to 300 million. I don't think they invested much in marketing, you know, it, they just responded to, to the call of the market. And the genius in product development is to develop a great user experience. And yeah, so you would time. focus on you know, solving a problem and the actual user experience of the product. No. No. Not solving a problem but creating some such a wonderful, beautiful product that will resonate with the heart of the user. I cannot care less if it's a solved problem or it doesn't solve problem or it's just have to provide the user with, with this feeling, you know, that is, is, is happy, you know, and, uh, and ask me how I come to how I came to this realization. Yossi, how did you come to this realization? Great, great question. I'm glad you asked it. So I will tell you. When we released the ICQ, you know, in the first day maybe forty people used it, and then in the next day maybe eighty people have used it. In the first months, 2,000 people used it. In the second months, another 10,000 people used it. And since the developers made a bet among ourselves whether this product will ever get more than 3,000 users, when we got to 10,000, we began to be surprised. This was November 96, February 97, we had already a quarter of a million users and Microsoft called us. And by July, we had 1 million users, and in September, we had 2 million users. And I was sitting and trying to figure what's going on here, how from where all these users are coming, you know, they came from nowhere, nobody approached them ever, we didn't do any advertising, any marketing, any and in nothing, you know, it was like, like when you see at your own ants and you ask from where all these ants came and how do they know that I sp <laughs> spilled sugar on the floor. <laughs> and then after we sold the ICQ for a very nice price, you mentioned it, and bearing in mind that we had no revenues at that time, this was really nice. I came to the conclusion that if I can develop one similar product a week, not more, one new product a week, I can make, a, if I can re replicate it, I will have a nice uh, way of uh, making a living, you know. And I decided that I want to develop the universal, unified, unified, universal, globalized theory of compelling user experience. Because I came to the conclusion that what brought the users is the user experience. You know, they, we gave them something that gave them a tremendous feeling. Today, by the way, I understand a little bit better what attract them and if you want remind me i will answer you later but nevertheless i understood that we have to create great user experience yeah and then i said okay i'm going to create the algorithm for great user experience i spent three years i'm not joking i have here 
next to me in my library with shelves and shelves and shelves of books about every conceivable manifestation of user experience in every walk of life, you know, in, in spectacles, in food, in sex, in travel, in hunting, in storytelling, how you capture the heart of a person. And I try to, to formulate this theory, you know, I divided the user experience into experiences into clusters, you know, the thrill of the hunting. This was my explanation for eBay. And I took, I took a successful company and I tried to do reverse engineering. What is there? And after three years, I published all my finding in a big in a big PowerPoint, which I call it, the first 100 million users are always the most difficult ones. I watch that, yeah. Yeah, once, once you, you get to 100 million, then it goes easy. And, uh, and I came also to the realization that once you are able to reduce something to an algorithm and to replicate it, the magic goes away. It become it become a commodity. It's not it's not exciting anymore, or it's less exciting. It become benign. You still can enjoy it, but it become benign. And I'll give you one example from many. On the twenty fifth of December, eighteen seventy eight. 25,000 people gathered in Manhattan, in lower Manhattan, and went on a train journey of two hours to a small village in New Jersey called Menlo Park. And you have to guess why they have done it. Why? Why? <clears throat> because it was the first evening, it was Christmas evening, that Thomas Alva Edison litted, litted is the word, litted his laboratory in electric mm. light. And instead of this smoky, dark, weak gas light, all of a sudden the whole building glue. You know, today you go to your office, the, you switch the light on, and you don't give a shit. You, you are not impressed with it. You take it for granted. But try to spend uh, a night in your office when you have an uh, electricity break. So one, one thing, one realization was that it cannot be... Same thing, by the way, is with instant messaging. You know, when we just released it, whenever we had a disruption of the service, we got curses and emails, and otherwise we got emails, ICQ, I love you, etc., etc. Second realization is that it's more or less impossible to develop the the algorithm, and the algorithm worked like this, I'm, I'm certain, you know, I cannot prove it. I'm sure that God, every now and then, go down to earth and goes among the sleeping kids, and, and from time to time, time is take, how you call this, uh, this thing he holds uh, in his hand? What do you call this? Uh, like a... Like, like a, a king, what a king uh, hold. Like, like, like a wand? Or like, a scepter? Like, maybe, yeah. And he touched the, sh the shoulders of kids. You see a kid, his name is Volkan, Wolfgang Amadeus. He will tell him, you will have a unique talent to write music which will hypnotize people and will make them happy and will make them joyful. And then he find another kid, his name is Steve Spielberg, and he tell him, you will grow up and you will know how to write 
stories and present them in movies, which will be very compelling. And then you see another kid, his name is Pavlo, and you tell him you will know how to paint in a way that nobody else knows how to paint. You know, the ability to resonate with the heart of user is such a God gift and it's such unique that since then, you know, I, inv I invested in 86 internet companies and few, and few in other spaces. By the way, you mentioned that I invested in 100 companies. You forgot to mention that uh, at least 30 of them didn't go anywhere. They busted, they disappeared, they, they gave me a lot of headaches and shame. <laughs> and they just proved that my success, if, if any, was just an interrupt, interruption in a whole chain of failures, you know, through my life. But that's a different, different story. But nevertheless, so the, 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 my conclusion, if you see somebody who is uniquely talented, remember this is like finding a gold nugget, gold nugget, nugget you call it, right? In the mind. Don't leave it, just take it. You have something to do with him. You don't have take him, take him, take the talented people to work with you, provided they are not assholes. Because you don't want to spend your life being surrounded by assholes. So here I give you, you know, a whole life experience in 10 minutes. You know, Yossi, the, so the conclusion from that talk, 100 million users, your long study of great user experience. Would you say, though, once you figure out the algorithm, it, it can't be I replicated? I didn't figure the algorithm because uh, there is no algorithm. Right. There is talent. You know, the algorithm is built in the wiring of the, the people I think if you will ask Mozart how to write a beautiful music, he will not be able to explain it. He will say, I go to the piano and I begin to play and I think about it and... Uh, yeah. We know, today, we know today why the, these experiences are creating this kind of reaction and this has to do with... Uh, secretion of dopamine in the brain and addiction and, and uh, different uh, explanations. But, but to have the talent, how, how to create all these things, we don't know. And by the way, when I was in the software, we didn't regard the screen as a substrate to express user experience on it. But once, the HTML came and the 64,000 colors came and the ability to, to use the screen in order to, to put graphic, etc. software became also a work of art. Or let me rephrase it, software can become a work of art. I'll give you an example, you know, again, look at Zoom. I think the tile paradigm that they can put 49 people and you can see all of them in one glance. This is a work of art because it creates such a, such a experience. And if you want to know the experience, wait until you are joining a Zoom with 49 people and then turn the screen off and you will see the difference in, in, in your whole whole existence. Yossi, you mentioned like right before we talked, you were talking to the CIO at Zoom. What was something that they shared with you that was interesting? Well, I interview him for an event we have uh, we have this week called CyberTech. And if I tell you now what uh, what he shared with me, then you will not go to the event. So you better go to the event. And, uh, and uh, see, but uh, I can tell you the first question I asked him. I asked him, and if you want the answer, you know, you go, you go to, to see. I asked him, how is it, 
what is the feeling to be part of a team which changed forever the life of seven and a half billion of us? Because I think what Zoom was able to provide at this time of Corona, when nobody could leave home and definitely not flying, etc., was something which is by far than just the technological platform. You know, they were able to enable, they were enabling people to connect with each other, which is really something something big. Huge. Um, you mentioned curiosity. And I'm wondering, people out there who have, you know, um, kids, um, what did you do with your children um, to instill curiosity? And um, maybe just talk about what, some of the stuff that you did with to instill in your children. Well, I, I can tell you that since very young age, I tried to expose them <laughs> to as many as many different kinds of, uh, of experiences, you know, from subscribing, of course, you don't do it anymore, I think, you know, to National Geographic magazines and take them to museum. And uh, my oldest kid, I used to drag him when he was, uh, when he was uh, high school, no, before high school even, 78, no, with me to my, my business uh, meetings. At that time, I was in mm -hmm. charge of uh, some of the chemical industry in Israel and he used to drive with me to see the plant. I used to tell him, you sit and you attend the meeting and you don't talk, you just absorb. And then after the meeting, ask me whatever <coughs> you want. And I used to purchase for them uh, encyclopedias, etc., etc. And And toys, you have to... <coughs> and books, you have to expose them to as many different and, <clears throat> and unrelated, unrelated things. You know, you have to, to challenge their synopsis. I think it's very, very important. By the way, uh, science showed today that small kids, you know, age of three, Two, if the kids are being, being provoked with a lot of things and different things and toys, etc., their brain is developing in a much richer way than if they are just spent time in the crib <clears throat> doing nothing. So keep them busy. What was your, your son had a role in ICQ? didn't have a role. He was one of the inventors and one of the co- and the co-founders, you know. Mm -hmm. the, in America, they have this, uh, this expression of this lucky sperm club. You are familiar with this <laughs> expression? I don't um, know if it's okay or it's not politically correct. No, it's totally fine. You can say whatever you like. <laughs> okay, so the lucky sperm, usually the lucky sperm club goes go down, you know, from father to son. In my case, it was like Salmon. I'm upstream lucky sperm. <laughs> because uh, he and three friends of him came to me one day and said they have an idea, they need funding. At that time, I was already funding startups. And they wanted funding. And because of my guilt feelings, you know, I gave them... The I asked funding for what? They said, we cannot tell you. It's... Uh, <laughs> confidential, which give you an idea how much I'm being trusted by, right. by, the, by my family. But uh, he was one of the four guys who invented uh, this uh, web-wide instant messaging, if you want. So his Isn't pitch that? was, we need money, but we can't tell you what it is or what it's for. This was the, no, no, we need the money, but we cannot trust you <laughs> to tell you what we are going to do with it. Um, 
I love it. So as far as the, you know, ICQ goes, you know, you mentioned investing, you know, see, and, um, and I mentioned the Nolan Bushnell uh, situation. What's that? I have a story. Go ahead, yeah. But first of all, in the beginning of your talk, I didn't understand why you mentioned Mobileye. Mobileye? Yeah, did you mention Mobileye? Or Mobileye, just, yeah. In what context? Did you um, in the context of, you know, when I was talking to Moise, he talked about, you know, right now, kind of to your point where, you be, you're mentioning you become the blonde hair, blue eye after you sell and everything, you're a genius. But what I love about the, the journey is there's a lot of, it's not just ups, right? There's a lot of downs in that journey, even th though there may be a big exit in the end. So it's not an easy journey. Yeah, but I don't know why you mentioned Mobileye, but well, let me tell you a story about... Uh... Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's about uh, Mobileye. So I will tell you about Waze and Mobileye. In my mind, it's now all uh, confused. Okay, so first of all, with Waze. Waze, Waze are not nice people, I have to tell you that. You know, it's not, not pleasant for me to say it in the front of all your audience, but they are not a decent people, and I will tell you why I'm saying it. You know, they offered me to invest in Waze at a valuation of $5 million. And I asked them, what is Waze? They told me Waze is an application that drivers are plotting the maps. They are drawing the maps according they their driving. They find new roads and new street names and they're updating maps. And I asked them the valuation, they told me $5 million. So I told them, you want me to invest in $5 million in order to invest to enable a bunch of amateurs to draw maps looked to me totally, totally crazy because I remember the map building that the British government left in Tel Aviv in, in Yuda Levy corner of Lincoln. It was like three stories huge building where they used to draw maps by hand, etc. And this guy thought they will draw the, the rock from under it. So I sent them to hell. Three years later, I read that they are going to sell this cockeyed application to Google for $1 billion. So I said, okay, I called, I called them and I said, hey, you remember you offered me to, to invest in the company and uh, I refused. Okay, so I reconsidered and I'm happy to invest in $5 million. They told me to go to hell. So you can trust me, they're not decent people. But I tell you about uh, Mobileye. So Mobileye, which I was not involved, like they didn't offer me to invest. I just uh, heard what they're doing. Mobileye is selling the company for $15 billion. Now, $15 billion <coughs> is a lot of money even for SoftBank. You know, it's really big chunk of money. And yet the other one not, the, the leading... The, the highest circulation newspaper in Israel calls me in the morning when it was announced and tell me, Yossi, as, as a, a person who made one of the most famous exits in Israel, what is the advice you can, you can give the Mobileye founders? So I told them, this is not the right question. Considering the fact that my exit was four hundred million dollars and their exit was fifteen billion, which is like almost forty times as much, the right question: What they can tell me, not what I can. <laughs> tell me. So that was my mobile, my mobile story, and I can tell you the number of great deals which I missed is almost as embarrassing as the list of lousy deals which I didn't miss. So I developed my career on three legs, you know, one good deals which I didn't miss, one shitty deals which I didn't miss, and one great deals which I did miss. That's the sad story of my business life. Um, 
was there a bigger miss than ways that you had? Yes, there was a bigger miss. There, and then you have to tell them that I didn't ask you the, 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 the I didn't request you that you will ask me this question. But it came very appropriate. So, so I tell this story on the radio the day of uh, when Waze was sold. And I tell this story. And then I get in the afternoon a call from a friend of mine by the name of Yossi Langotsky. Yossi Langotsky is a very well-known Israeli gentleman, and he was a geologist, and uh, he is responsible to a great respect to the discovery of the huge uh, gas reserves at the offshore of Israel. Mm. I mean, he maintained since the 70s that there is a huge deposit of gas at the offshore of Tel Aviv, and he was kind of fufu by everybody until uh, somebody was willing to go and drill and they found this mammoth gas reserve. So this is Yossi Langotsky. And he called me and he told me, Vadi, why you are bragging about the money you did make in, uh, in, uh, in ways? You remember that I asked you to invest $5 million in, in the gas drilling and you just sent me to hell. Would you invest? At that time, you would make a quarter of a billion dollars or something like this. So you should, so you should mention ways, you should mention how stupid you were in not <laughs> investing in the gas. So I told him, Yossi, from now on, this is what I will do. And here you gave me an opportunity to That's do right. it. That's Once right. Again. You know, you, know, so you mentioned as an investor, there are investments you make, some succeed, some don't succeed. I'm curious of the ones you wrote off. You're like, it's just not working. You know, those are not going to go well, but they ended up having great exits. I wonder if you talk about one of those where you thought it was, you kind of wrote it off in your portfolio, but it turned around and did have a great exit. And maybe what, what was it that turned it around? Yeah, I can. I cannot. I cannot recall right now. I have. I have to to go and find one to use it in the portfolio of examples. But definitely, definitely, sometimes, sometimes, a company which is not going anywhere, all of a sudden, have like last minute a big success happened to an Israeli company. If you few months ago that they almost wrote it off and then it went public for over a billion dollar. But this is, I wouldn't say that this is, this is a common, a common one. I tell you what is a common, a common is guys are going to create a company and then after a few months see that they have to recalculate the trajectory that the market is not as they, assume the product should be different and they are doing early pivot. So this is very common. I would say that every company, almost every successful company made one pivot in its, uh, in its life. It's much harder to, 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 to do something for five years and then to go and do a pivot, though it's also happened. Now, my investment philosophy, you know, if this is the lifeline and the value line of a company, you have many, many regions where you can enter, increase the value, and go out. My sweet spot, and I'm not suggesting this is the only sweet spot, but my sweet spot is to be the very first investor. Mm. I always want to be the very first investor, which people think it's the highest risk. I don't agree with it, but I don't want to go to it. Now, maybe I will say I don't agree to it because it's a very, it's high risk for one company. But if you do it for portfolio, it's enough that few companies succeed and they take care of the, all the companies which don't succeed. So this is the secret. The problem is that every time you close a company, you feel a punch in your belly. So people cannot stand this punches 
they don't count the 10 small punches equal one big success. No, they say 10 punches is 10 punches and one success <laughs> is offsetting one punch while from economic point of view, one success offset can offset 50 punches if the success is, uh, is big. So my, my investment philosophy is what they call in Wharton, they teach you four years and then they call it highly diversified, high beta, high volatility portfolio management. And I call it, it spray and pray. <laughs> so so this, this is my, my investment uh, philosophy and now I don't remember anymore what was the question. Well, when, you, when, you, when someone comes to you, let's say, you know, you're going to be the first investor. What are you looking for in that particular person or company? Okay, so first of all, in the beginning of my investments, I thought the idea is uh, important. Then I realized that the idea is overrated. And today I know the idea that doesn't mean a thing. It's not about idea, it's about execution. And execution, in order to get great education, a great uh, execution, you need very talented people. You need people probably with the three, three properties. First of all, they have to be talented as we discussed it before. Second, they have to be passionate because what people will do for passion, you cannot buy with all the money in the world. And third, they have to be nice in order to be able to build a team around them. Hmm. And you don't want to deal with assholes. You don't want to deal with non-ethical people. So it's the team, the team, and the team. If you have good people, you should go and uh, invest. Hmm. According to my, my strategy, which is not suitable for everybody, you know, for instance, this strategy is good for angels. It's not good for VCs. Because if VCs will go only to be the first investor, they will end up be investing in 2,000 companies, which they will not be able to manage. Yossi, you mentioned there was a talk I listened to. In the, in the opening of that talk, you talked about how um, 140 missiles were shot at Israel. I don't know if it was that day, that, day, that week, that month, but <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? What, what's yeah. the... You, you know, the climate, so people get an idea of, you know, you're building company, but there's all this other stuff because you're living in Israel. Yeah, the, the, I mentioned what you, the, the, the quote you are taking is from a certain evening in one of our conflicts with the Gaza Strip where 140 missiles were launched in one day, maybe 15 of them were launched in the same minute in order to avoid the Iron Dome. And you can see on uh, YouTube a video how these Iron Dome missiles are intercept intercepting with all the 15, all the 15 missiles. Mm. But the point is that this video was taken from a wedding which took place just under all these missiles flying on the way. And I mention it in order to, to illustrate one particular, one particular uh, question to do with the, the character of the Israelis. Because I'm asking, I'm asked time and again, what we put in the water or what we give to smoke to our kids, <laughs> that all of them are so passionate about uh, creating startups, you know, which is kind of a, kind of a national, national obsession. And my suggestion that it, 
has to do not with education or technology or government support or all these things which are usually being mentioned and they are important, but it's a cultural phenomena. This is cultural phenomena, what, what the people want to do, how they behave, how they act, what motivates them, you know, how they mobilize themselves, etc., etc. And uh, Israel, after all, is a small community, nine million people, which feel, uh, or used to feel, strong joint destiny. But this, looking back, it looked to me like three generations away because then came the corona and changed the whole, uh, the whole uh, landscape. And I am quite worrying about the corona, about the social mm. effect of the corona, about a lot of, lot of things, I'm really very concerned, unfortunately. About what specifically? About many, many things. About, first of all, about the destiny of the people who are not involved in the high tech. You know, because the corona crash, crash in a very cruel way, the weakest members of society. Hmm. And the governments are not standing up to this challenge. You know, the, the corona take the middle class and turn them to poor people and take the poor people who even don't have a voice, at least the middle class, can protest, can speak, can lobby, can write to their congressmen, but there is a whole, whole layers of society of people which are very weak. Hmm. And the corona, the corona put them in impossible, impossible situation. And I don't, I don't see, I don't see the solution. I don't see the government is coming with a solution. I'm really mm -hmm. worried about these people. That's why you're worried because you don't see, you're not sure what will what will have uh, to happen. I'm worried. I'm worried about all kinds of processes which are now going on, but I'm not sure that I want to share my grievance with your uh, audience. You know, I don't know them. <laughs> in touch internet levels. So it better they will perceive me as a joker, you know, tell jokes. I got it. You know, one thing you mentioned at some point is, you know, mentioning the um, resilience of uh, the Israeli people, as you said, they're fueled by guilt and panic. Yeah, this is not Israeli, this is Jewish people all over Jewish the place. Jewish people. Yeah. Got it. You know, first of all, you say I want to be the first one to thank you. Um, this has been tremendous um i have one last question before we end um but just thank you for sharing your experience your knowledge your lessons your jokes um and last last two questions um are one what's been a low moment um and what's been a proud moment for you over over the years Uh, low moment, I'm not sure. Uh, look, low moments are always associated with some sickness in the family. Unless you want me to tell you about low moment in business. But, uh, but you know, all of us, all of us are experiencing this sometime difficult, uh, fam uh, difficult moments. And this was uh, also in my case. I moments, you know, life, life uh, pampered me and gave me in some, in some strange way, many, many moments of uh, joy in my, in my career, in my life, etc. I'm not going to begin to, to, to count all of them because it will sound as bragging. So we will, should leave it in kind of a mystery, let's say. 
I guess, you know, maybe low moment could be business, it could be family, but um, I know you've had your hand in working as a, I don't know if you call it a diplomat in your career, but maybe talk about the Israeli-Palestinian relationship, What because you've done some things in, in government too. Yeah, in government, uh, I used to run the Ministry of Natural Resources. It was called Ministry of Development. And I was chairman of Israel Chemicals, which is the, at that time, it was the holding company of the chemical industry. And I also created the Ministry of, of Energy, but somehow I participated in four peace negotiations, one with the Egyptians, once in the with the Jordanians, once with the Palestinians, and once with the Syri- one with the Syrians. And no doubt that one of the high moments were signing the peace agreement with the Egyptians and signing the peace agreement with the Jordanians, which was, well, like a great, great, uh, great moment. And unfortunately, I don't see the, at least currently, the, the negotiations with the Palestinians going anywhere, which I think it's a high time. We are now already 53 years. 53, 50 from 67, 70, 80, 90, yeah, 50, 54 years. And uh, I think it's high time to resolve this conflict. We resolved some bigger f- conflicts in the past. Uh, so I don't think it's a question of high moment or low moment, but it's something which, which we have to do. Yeah. Yossi, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and sharing everything. And uh, everyone, uh, hope you enjoyed and got a lot of nuggets. Thanks, yeah. Yossi. Thank you very much for your patience. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.